It's a pleasure to speak to you all. Uh, good afternoon in the United States. Good evening over in the UK. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to share with you uh, some interesting uh, research and information about uh, a broad topic called autoimmune encephalopathies. And uh, thank you to AONM, who's been our partner in the UK and has been um, providing different types of educational forums. So I look forward to uh, visiting with you more and talking to you a bit more about how the panel that we run here at Molecular Labs uh, plays a role in uh, these various types of disorders that are broadly classified into these autoimmune encephalopathies. So uh, I want to share three different sections with you. Uh, one about autoimmune uh, neurology-based disorders and what we might call uh, emergence or really it's a re-emergence of medical and clinical relevance um, because many of these disorders and things we'll talk about uh, have been historical and uh, you'll see that there are many medical models that actually tie into these different types of disorders we'll talk about. Um, one specific topic that I want to talk about that has of interest is called molecular mimicry. And the reason that that is important is because it also is a mechanism uh, that is understood to be a trigger for many of these chronic disabling disorders. Uh, then secondly, what I want to talk about is the clinical presentation of these autoimmune encephalopathies. And we'll focus a bit more uh, in particular on PANDAS and PANS and then the nomenclature, and then even the alternative nomenclature that's coming up in how to understand and identify really what the root and etiology is that they're talking about. We'll talk about the mechanisms for these conditions, and we'll talk a bit about some of the infectious triggers that are pretty common for these uh, different disorders. And then I wanna talk about the antineuronal antibody targets that are in the Cunningham panel and then why these were biologically significant and why they were selected. And then uh, importantly, uh, show you uh, not only internal case studies, but published case studies, and then a manuscript that we've submitted in, in, in a review for uh, another 62 patients uh, in identifying uh, the connection between these symptoms and these uh, antineuronal antibodies and their presence. And then at the end, I'd like to summarize a little bit about what to take away from this. Uh, and then uh, there'll be time for some questions and answers. So uh, this broad subject area called autoimmune neurology, uh, it's really just the interaction between the immune system and the nervous system. So uh, the immune system and our knowledge of the immune system really has been gaining uh, interest over time. Uh, in 1983, I was working at Genentech and uh, HIV actually occurred during that time and there were cases that were being identified. Um, at that time, it, it was really difficult because immunology was really not significantly different than what it was many, many decades before that. Since then, there's a lot of immunology understanding for its use in cancer and other types of therapeutics. But uh, just briefly, we have both an innate and an adaptive immune system. And as you can see here, uh, they take uh, effect at different times. Our innate is very quickly uh, assimilated against in foreign invaders. And then over time, our T cells, our B cells, our antibodies. And then what we'll talk about even more is those that are involved in the brain. And this interaction then is these, the immune system begins to target uh, different parts of our nervous system, uh, both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, and in particular, certain organs um, that actually will then, uh, you'll manifest or a person will manifest different symptoms based on the functions of those organs, or in this case, the dysfunctions of those organs. So historically, if you look at uh, just autoimmune neurology, and I did a PubMed search where you can look at all the publications. And if you type in autoimmune neurology, what you can see over the last, oh, let's say 20 years, um, you can see a huge increase in the number of articles, peer reviewed research involved that's uh, interested in and publishing studies in autoimmune neurology. There's several categories that, that are fall under this. And I just briefly want to touch on it. 
So uh, everyone's familiar with multiple sclerosis, which falls into an autoimmune central nervous system disorder. Uh, and it's, it's very well defined and understood. We're not gonna speak about that in, in particular. Uh, there are also um, autoimmune neurology disorders called perineoplastic disorders. And para meaning alongside of and neoplastic meaning cancer. Those uh, autoimmune disorders that are associated with patients who have uh, different types of cancers and as the immune system begins to identify and fight off the cancer, in some cases what happens is they begin to develop antibodies against other parts of their body, uh, such as limbic encephalitis and other types of uh, perineoplastic disorders. Uh, we won't talk much more about that. Then there are other types of autoimmune uh, neurologic disorders called neuromuscular syndromes. Uh, myesthesia gravis is one, uh, and that is where the antibodies are actually attacking the neuromuscular junction and inhibit the movement of these muscles. Uh, and again, it's another autoimmune neurologic disorder. What we will talk about today though is the autoimmune encephalopathies. Um, and there are various types and there's more antibodies that are being discovered and identified that play a role, such as the NMDA receptor encephalitis, uh, the voltage-gated uh, potassium channels, the GABA, and in particular, we're gonna talk about PANDAS and PANS. So uh, you'll find many different uh, categories of science and medicine are, are continuing to gain interest. Some, some may call it autoimmune neurology, others may call it neuroimmunology. You might see neuroinflammatory disorders and many other names, uh, but basically, again, it's the intersection of the immune system and the neurologic system uh, and in conjunction with the neurologic system is the brain, therefore the psychiatric or neuropsychiatric symptoms. So these autoimmune disorders that we're gonna speak about involve parts of the basal ganglia and the basal ganglia in the brain uh, is responsible for things like motor control, uh, various types of learning, our cognitive functions, even our emotional functions, uh, interestingly, even eye movement and various types of, of functions uh, that are executive functions that control different parts of our body. Another interesting uh, and important fact is that uh, two other disorders that are known to be disorders of the basal ganglia include Parkinson's and Huntington's, whereas Parkinson's is a movement disorder uh, and is clearly identified now as an autoimmune disorder against certain targets in the brain, uh, whereas Huntington's has a, a, a copy number variation, which is a genetic uh, issue, but also involves movement and uh, the basal ganglia. So you'll see these different terms like infectious autoimmune encephalopathy, infectious autoimmune encephalitis, infectious autoimmune disorders of the brain, um, and again, referring to the trigger in which we're gonna talk a little bit more about that these tend to be infectious triggers, but there are also believed to be uh, environmental triggers. So just briefly, um, there's a couple of Danish studies that have identified a, a very strong correlation with infection, the immune system and mental illness. And what you can see here is these two studies, one involved 4,500 individuals uh, and the other was about 3.6 million individuals. In the first study, what they found was that patients who had elevated interleukin-6, uh, which is an immune cytokine, were more likely to be depressed at age 18 years. And that was increased by 55% over the, the population. And they also found that IL-6 uh, baseline levels increased or higher in, uh, levels increased the risk of psychotic experiences and psychiatric disorders by age 18 by 81%. Um, the other thing they found with the 3.6 million patient study was that if a patient was hospitalized for an infection, it increased the risk of having a mood disorder like bipolar or uh, depression by 62%. And if a patient was hospitalized for an autoimmune disease, 
it increased the risk of a mood disorder by 45%. Whereas what they found that if the two factors together were both being hospitalized for uh, an infection or and an autoimmune disease, the risk of subsequent mood disorders were 135%. So there's population precedent in showing that there is a connection, but we really want to look at more uh, specific biology and etiology. Um, if you look at publications uh, over a period of time, you can see even in autism, which is a spectrum disorder, and it's uh, categorized by certain groupings of symptoms as which are most uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. In these published studies, you can see that over 650,000 patients studied had a family history of some autoimmune disease. And so what you see is that there's this immune dysfunction um, and which is a genetic predisposition. Uh, and then there's something that, that, that ends up triggering that. Another interesting uh, study you can find if you look even since 2012 when this study was published, that there was over 127 published studies that were demonstrating immune dysregulation in autism patients. Now it's not to say that all autism is a result of an immune dysregulation, um, but there clearly is a portion of these patients who are diagnosed with autism um, that are involved with immune abnormalities. Um, so kind of to summarize this uh, a little bit is that this infection immune brain connection and its relationship to neuropsychiatric disorders uh, can revolve around this axis, which I like to look at, that you have on one point these infectious and non-infectious triggers that can be bacteria, viruses, parasites, even environmental triggers. And then the immune system, in this case, which triggers the inflammation, the microglia activation, uh, antibodies, uh, mast cell activation, cytokines, and end up directing it towards the brain. Hence, you see these neurologic and neuropsychiatric symptoms. And it's all underpinned by a genetic predisposition with immune system dysfunction. And we'll talk a little bit more about this and how this actually uh, is proposed in a mechanism of how this works. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the particular antibodies and then a bit more about the treatments. So we're not talking really about anything which is totally new. Um, there is a long history of uh, these infection triggered neuropsychiatric disorders uh, and in 19 or 1894, rather, uh, Sir William Olsler described this bizarre and perceptive behaviors, uh, which he called Korea Minor. And he made that connection between the obsessive compulsive disorders of these children uh, and Sydenham Korea. And Sydenham Korea is uh, abnormal movements, uh, uncontrolled motor movements, as you can see here. Uh, but it was also termed uh, St. Vitus's dance. Um, it was characterized by these uncontrollable abnormal movements, um, this fine motor control loss, loss of emotional control. And if you um, uh, tie it back to uh, what we talked about previously, the basal ganglia, again, the responsibility of the basal ganglia is the uh, executive functions of those symptoms. This is also uh, is triggered by a group A streptococcus or what we might think of as uh, what we get with strep throat. Uh, and Sydenham chorea is the neurologic manifestation of rheumatic fever, which is in these patients uh, with rheumatic fever. Uh, the strep, in this case, the bacteria, triggers antibodies uh, to be made against it, but the particular antibodies that are made are made against a portion of the bacteria that cross-reacts with the heart valves. And hence, that's where rheumatic fever comes from. Uh, of course, the treatment is uh, penicillin or some uh, antibiotic. And the other target in the case of Sydenham chorea is the basal ganglia, which hence results in these movement disorders.
So if we look a little bit more about strep and uh, the uh, identification of what we call the epitopes, which are just the parts of the organism in which um, these antibodies are directed against. In particular, the ones that are cross-reactive are against what we call these group A carbohydrate or M proteins. And through a process which we call molecular mimicry, they then are made and directed against uh, the basal ganglia, the heart valves, as we talked about in the case of rheumatic fever, uh, arthritic types of uh, complaints in the joints, uh, attacking the kidney, uh, and other parts of the body. So if you think about this, it's uh, in wartime, we call this friendly fire. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where that uh, term came from, but friendly fire meaning um, our own troops begin attacking uh, our, our own troops and they use some of the strongest weapons that they have because they cannot differentiate between the enemy uh, and our own troops. And this is basically the parallel to uh, autoimmune disorders and what we call molecular mimicry. So this term molecular mimicry is really well established and it is understood to be a precursor to many autoimmune dysfunctions. So if you look here uh, at um, these neurologic or CNS conditions, um, Guillain-Barre, multiple sclerosis, sydenham Korea, and we mentioned myesthesia gravis, um, or stenia gravis, in which the antibodies are actually attacking the neuromuscular junction, in particular, uh, a receptor that we call the acetylcholine receptor and you'll see the parallel when we talk about dopamine and dopamine receptors. These antibodies are directed against, in particular, a receptor that is involved in triggering the muscle movement. And so in these patients uh, with uh, myasthenia gravis, what you see is these, these um, inhibition of uh, motor function and motor movement. Another similar type of mechanism in Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, involves uh, the attack of the myelin sheath uh, around the nerves. And the myelin sheath is comprised of certain types of lipids, lipids of which uh, we'll talk about uh, lysogangliocide. And it does occur after uh, different types of infections, but in particular, um, they, they see a lot occurring with Campylobacter. And then the antibodies begin attacking the myelin sheath and you start seeing the wasting of uh, the muscle tone and then eventually the diaphragm and other motor movements in which a patient will no longer have motor control. So um, there are many others in this paper by Cusick. What you can see is they have identified um, putative in many cases identified common epitopes of different types of autoimmune disorders that have occurred through molecular mimicry of which a particular organism has been a trigger or multiple organisms. Uh, diabetes type one is understood to be an autoimmune disorder in which antibodies are attacking different parts of the pancreas uh, and triggered by many of these different types of uh, organisms. So with that as a background, we want to talk about pandas. Uh, and, and pandas is really just another manifestation of an autoimmune uh, neurologic-based uh, syndrome. And it, the acronym for pandas is Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with the Streptococcal Infection. Um, and, it, and it was identified by Dr. Susan Sweeto uh, back in the, the late 90s where there was a first group of patients, in this case 50 that they identified, that had sudden onset of obsessive compulsive disorder that was preceded by an infection with strep. Now she identified that there were other types of infections in other children that also had preceded similar types of symptoms, 
um, but they chose to focus on those that were homogeneous in symptoms and in a uh, trigger and, and hence uh, the name PANDAS and the criteria for PANDAS. So in the yellow box here, this is what we just described as PANDAS. But you'll also see many different terminologies like PITANS and CANS and now the term PANS. And in 2013 uh, is when uh, the identification and was published in 2015 um, that PANS, uh, named as Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome, uh, actually encompassed all of these other um, types of conditions or syndromes. So PANDAS, with the S standing for strep, is included in PANS and therefore that nomenclature um, is, is a PANDAS is a subset of PANS. Uh, I know it can be confusing, um, but the importance is um, these are the criteria uh, which involve here is infection triggered, um, bacterial, viral, parasitic, fungal, uh, and possibly environmental, that it is autoimmune uh, and that the immune uh, is then uh, dysfunctional and it begins being directed towards a part of the body, in this case the brain. Uh, the resulting symptoms are neuropsychiatric sim uh, syndromes that have multiple heterogeneous symptoms and, and this is part of the challenge uh, with these disorders, whether it's in children or adults or, or whatever we would call it, is because it doesn't fall into these nice classifications of where we can say all individuals with this have these symptoms. And this also makes it difficult in diagnosis. It is also directed against a portion of the brain. <clears throat> in this part, uh, we've talked about various portions of the basal ganglia. And, and the criteria for PANS and PANDAS is this term acute onset. Um, and it is important in the sense that uh, the higher likelihood that all these patients with sudden onset, meaning almost like within hours or within a day or overnight or a couple days, um, it's pretty easy to identify versus what we see many times is maybe a gradual onset where the immune system kicks in over several days, over several weeks. Um, and so the, the research is still needed to identify, is this the same syndrome? But by definition, because PANDAS and PANS is a clinical definition and it's a clinical diagnosis, then uh, these are the, the uh, criteria in which uh, the conditions are, are identified and diagnosed. So what are the symptoms and, and how do they get diagnosed? Um, and it's estimated that one out of 150 to uh, maybe 200 children in the US, uh, which is where it's been studied most, is uh, related to or has PANDAS or PANS. As you can see, uh, the diagnostic criteria, um, it's, it's pretty broad, um, but the first one is abrupt onset of OCD or restricted food intake. And restricted food intake, um, can be sometimes uh, maybe confused with anorexia, uh, but when you're talking about a four or five year old uh, child, it's not likely uh, that that's anorexia. Uh, in this case, it's really an OCD-like behavior uh, in which individuals, or in these case children, um, uh, believe that they have a food phobia, a fear of contamination, a fear of choking, a fear of throwing up, um, so basically, the first criteria is abrupt onset of OCD or severely restricted food intake. And then having two of uh, the following, anxiety disorders, emotional ability or depression, irritability, aggression, oppositional behaviors, a developmental regression, deterioration in school performance. As you can see on the right panel here, uh, one of these uh, children um, who was drawing uh, when they had PANS or PANDAS uh, 
and then their ability to draw afterwards. Um, these could be confused with ADD and ADHD symptoms, uh, memory deficit, cognitive changes. You'll see sensory or motor abnormalities, um, somatic signs and symptoms, uh, inability to sleep, um, bedwetting, anuresis, meaning uh, a nine or 10 year old child now starting to wet their bed. Um, this has to do with a, a sphincter that's being controlled uh, by that part of the brain. Um, and then again, symptoms that can't be explained by other neurologic or medical disorders. So essentially, th this is a rule out uh, uh, disorder in that you're looking for, are there any other possible explanations for it? And then you look at here the heterogeneity of these symptoms it does make it quite difficult um, for this to be clinically uh, identified and observed. Um, but that's where it's very important because patients that do have these conditions, when properly diagnosed, uh, can be treated and you can see very, very remarkable recoveries. And the age at onset tends to be prepubertal. Uh, you see six and a half um, for uh, plus or minus three years uh, for ticks and 7.4 for OCD. And in this case, two boys outnumber girls 2.6 to 1. Um, so at the National Institutes of Mental Health, where these were studied and, and, and where Dr. Suido um, did a lot of her work, that the symptoms during these exacerbations can range to bedtime fears, school changes, distractions, frigidness, cariform movements. And then often you can see these comorbid diagnoses. <clears throat> so various things like uh, ADD, ADHD, uh, depression, anorexia. Um, and again, you can see how difficult this can be. Um, and which makes it a little challenging when uh, there are children, and we'll talk a little bit about adults uh, towards the end, but when individuals present with various types of symptoms such as these. So what's the mechanism and what's, what's at least understood is how this occurs. We talked about uh, the infectious part of it, the microbial, viral, fungal infections, of which we all get. Um, we all have an immune system that fights these off and uh, these, uh, our body does what it needs to do and it generates antibodies against these organisms. And uh, we do this every day of our life uh, and many times we don't even know it uh, because it's warding off infections um, silently. Uh, in, in an interesting analogy is when uh, people with HIV technically really don't die from HIV, they actually succumb to these uh, nosocomial or these common infections that typically normally healthy immune system individuals would ward off every day, whereas the, an individual with HIV and a weakened immune system is unable to mount a response um, that would protect them from these nosocomial infections. In these patients, uh, the antibodies in which they choose to make or their body choose to make, which is uh, in, in genetic terms, a random process, but there is a screening component that goes through the thymus in which the body tells the body what's self and what is non-self. And in this case, there's something that goes awry and through molecular mimicry, those particular antibodies then uh, are pushed out into um, the system. And in these cases, they are directed against the brain. In particular, we talked about the basal ganglia and in a um, analogy to friendly fire. Hence, then you will see these symptoms uh, and various types of symptoms uh, in different individuals. So Dr. Cunningham, a collaborating co-founder, has published extensively on the biology of this, uh, looking that these antibodies actually cross-react with the parts of the basal ganglia uh, 
in pandas and Sydenham chorea, and you see the purple staining indicates that these antibodies are binding to these parts of the brain in the basal ganglia, whereas in the control individuals, they're blue and not purple, and therefore they are not binding there. In another publication in Nature Medicine, looking at both these antibodies binding, but also uh, we'll talk a bit about the calmodulin uh, cam kinase, which is an enzyme that is responsible for the upregulation of uh, three neurotransmitters, dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. And so these antibodies were able to trigger and bind to the basal ganglia in SC or Sydenham chorea, but also were directed uh, and were against these gangliosides, which are uh, different types of lipids that are involved in the myelin sheath. So uh, the panel that we run and test here is called the Cunningham panel, named after Dr. Cunningham. And it is a panel of five different tests. And these five tests uh, are, are run and we identify in the first four antibodies that are directed against these particular targets, particularly those that are, are concentrated in the brain. And then the fifth one, which uh, we'll talk a little bit more in detail, is one that is the CAM kinase. Uh, it's a cell stimulation assay. Um, we've tested now over 8,500 uh, patients in the US and in other countries. And um, one of our doctors, Dr. Um, Amram Katz, uh, is now actually tested over 250 patients. And he's identified, uh, along with some correlation that we do see, is that patients that predominantly are positive with dopamine D1, meaning their antibodies are highly positive, they're directed against the dopamine D1 receptor, that they have often have psychiatric symptoms, including psychosis. In those patients that have antibodies directed against the dopamine D2L receptor, um, they find they're often positive with different type of movement disorders and impulsivity. In those patients that only have anti-lysogangliocide GM1, um, which is often positive with these neuropathic symptoms, including tics, and again, remembering lysogangliocide and these gangliocides involved in the myelin sheath, which protect the nerves in which the electrical transmission um, transverses. In the antitubulin patients or antibodies directed against tubulin, um, they often find that they're positive with patients who have cognitive complaints like OCD and brain fog. And uh, tubulin is identified and located in, in every cell in the body or every structural cell in the body. Um, but it's also known to be, have a role in other types of uh, biological functions, which we'll talk about also in a minute. And then the CAM kinase activity, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit, is involved with involuntary movements and uh, adrenergic uh, activation. Uh, it is a cell stimulatory activity that we measure. In other words, can an antibody stimulate this enzyme to be upregulated and do what it normally does, which is make more dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. So let me show you a few case studies. We have hundreds of these now uh, in which patients were tested prior to treatment, then treated, and then tested post-treatment. <clears throat> in this case study, uh, we see a 24-year-old uh, male. Uh, the presentation was obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, motor tics. Uh, he had lost 30 pounds. Again, uh, could have been confused with anorexia. Um, but uh, inability to concentrate, these other symptoms, uh, emotional ability, behavioral regression, et cetera. And uh, his panel is there. The CAM kinase was significantly elevated. And this is part of the reason that we do run all five is because we do not know ahead of time which markers would be or could be elevated. And we believe and are working on the connection between these and symptoms and potentially future opportunities for these and uh, optimal treatment. The patient had been treated then with one intravenous immunoglobulin and plasmapheresis. Uh, his symptoms completely reduced. 
uh, he was retested and his cam kinase went back into baseline. Uh, another young girl here uh, who had obsessive compulsive behaviors, uh, verbal tics, and the stimming behavior, which is an autism-like uh, behavior. Uh, she had trouble concentrating, uh, emotional ability, uh, urinary and sleep problems, uh, the dysgraphia, which uh, the showed the previously the inability to draw, uh, and this relapsing and remitting nature of the condition, which is characteristic of pandas and pans. And in her situation, there were two positives. One of them was the lysoganglioside antibodies and antitubulin. Um, and I believe she had, this one may have had a recent strep infection or one that was undiagnosed because she may not have had symptoms. Uh, it was identified the patient was treated with azithromycin, um, complete and rapid improvement in symptoms. Patient was tested and all of her antibodies uh, returned to baseline. I'm just gonna show you two more and then we'll move on. Um, another nine-year-old girl uh, was presenting with unknown origin of neuropsychiatric symptoms. Uh, this patient actually was diagnosed and did have Lyme disease positive by a Western blot. And her chief complaint was, mom, something's happened to my brain. And uh, uh, you can see here, three of the antibodies were positive and very strongly positive in one of them, the dopamine D1, the D2, and then the antitubulin. She was treated for the Lyme, which often is challenging to treat uh, with Azithromax, uh, ne uh, Neproxen, Omnicep, Bactrim, um, and then also three IVIG treatments. Um, she had complete symptom regression, and you can see upon retesting her panel is all back into baseline. And then one uh, last one here, a nine-year-old boy who presented 30 days after a strep infection uh, had OCD tics, couldn't concentrate. Uh, again, you see the emotional ability, separation anxiety, developmental regression, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this one, he had one positive, which was the CAM kinase assay. In this case, the patient had intravenous immunoglobulin also, um, and not all of them do, but um, some of these uh, may have been a bit more um, aggressive and they do respond uh, within one month, uh, had complete symptom elimination, and you can see the CAM kinase resolve back to baseline. And so let me just share with you how the biology of these targets impact that. So in the test one and two, which I mentioned about the dopamine D1 and D2 receptor, um, what you see up here, this uh, little globular looking type of, uh, it's a receptor in the uh, lipid bilayer of, in this case, brain cells. Um, these uh, dopamine, they're the dopamine transmitters uh, are uh, pre and post synaptic where they identify and they continue the impulses um, from one cell to the other. Uh, dopamine D1 and D2 are highly concentrated in uh, parts of uh, the basal ganglia. In particular, you can see here in the globus pallidus, the patamen, the um, caudate nucleus. Uh, and those are the parts, again, that are responsible for what we discussed in, in those different symptoms. The issue is that in these cases where antibodies are directed against these receptors, as you can see here with the antibodies, and then of course these green blocks, uh, just representative of something that fits into it, they can either act as an agonist, and an agonist is a substance that initiates a physical response. So um, basically, some of these antibodies can act like drugs, and they can actually stimulate the dopamine receptor. Whereas other antibodies that people may make actually could block or interfere, and they would have different symptoms because they would be blocking the dopamine receptor. And hence, you can see different types of symptom correlation. The third test uh, that I mentioned was the anti-lysogangliocyte GM1 um, and as you can see here on the right, a nerve cell 
And uh, these yellow uh, insulators, which are based out of myelin, the myelin sheath, but also of these gangliosides, and, and as mentioned with Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, the antibodies attack them and began to um, demyelinate them, and you see the wasting syndrome. Um, this is another type of a gangliocide that we uh, test and identify that's involved in certain ports, parts of neuronal cells in the brain. Then the fourth one, which is the tubulin, um, but tubulin, if you're familiar with it, it actually is believed to be or was believed to be just a scaffolding protein that holds cells together and kind of keeps their shape. Whereas if you see here on the right, um, these are different studies in which they found mutations in tubulin, and they found that um, these patients ended up with ALS, autism spectrum, dystonia, uh, basal ganglia defects, microcephaly, many uh, neurologic and um, the, the dysfunctions here. So what we find, particularly from a clinical standpoint in our population, as I mentioned, that we do see OCD and cognitive impairment often associated with anti-tubulin antibodies. And you can see aggressive or rage behavior uh, and many of these different symptoms um, that may be um, particularly associated with this particular antibody. Then there's the fifth test uh, in which uh, we call the calmodulin cam kinase. Uh, this is a cell stimulation test. <clears throat> As you can see on the left, the uh, identification of uh, this neuron in the brain there to there's a pre and a post synaptic neuron and the dopamine transmitters or dopamine uh, neurotransmitters um, empty from the presynaptic terminal and then they then bind to a receptor called the dopamine receptor d1 d2 and then once they trigger it, then the electrical impulse continues. Um, and so when you see in Parkinson's disease, uh, a lot of this is, uh, it's not completely it's, uh, understood, but it's also known that certain types of things that improve this dopaminergic type of activity improve patients with Parkinson's. But in this case, we're talking about actually an antibody that binds to the cell and it inhibits, or uh, not only can it inhibit the dopamine receptors, but by binding to the cell, it stimulates CAM kinase. And CAM kinase, when it's stimulated, produces more dopamine. So here you have an antibody that's telling the body to produce neurotransmitters. And as you can see on the right, you can see in Sydenham Korea or SC patients, very high activity. They have uncontrollable abnormal movements, motor movements. Pandas patients, moderately so, and then non-pandas patients, um, which were around baseline. So thinking about what are those infectious triggers, uh, and hopefully everybody's not now afraid that if we get an infection, we're going to get pandas or pans or some neuropsychiatric disorder. Um, these infections, though, uh, are known to be and have been associated with uh, these, these uh, disorders, but it doesn't mean that everyone that gets these will end up with these disorders. And that's part of the controversy with PANDAS is why does 98% of the children get strep infections and only 1 in 150 or 1 in 100 or 1 in 200 patients get PANS or PANDAS? Again, it has to do with the immune dysfunction component that an individual is making of the wrong antibodies. We see it with influenza A, varicella, mycoplasma, Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella, Coxsackie virus, and typically patients have more than one infection and it can be subclinical. So I'm gonna quickly run through a couple of these things so I can get to the end here and then uh, let you ask questions. Uh, this is a study that uh, we conducted of uh, 62 patients. There were 206 who had two tests, uh, pre and post. We separated the 62 into patients who got well, 
or improved, group two, patients who didn't get well or got worse, and we wanted to find out what was the correlation with their antibody titers and their symptoms before and after the treatment. So here's a heat map of all the patients who improved, but what their treatment, their pretreatment results look like. The red shows that they're strongly positive in the CAM, lysoganglioside tubulin, D1, D2. They were treated, this wasn't a treatment study, but they were treated with various treatments. And these that got well, as you can see, um, the vast majority of their patient, the patients, their antibodies went back into baseline, were greatly reduced. And you can see the blue compared to the orange is the number of positive tests in these patients. If we look at the patients who did not improve or got worse and what were their antibody titers prior to that, they did have still high antibody titers. Interestingly, not all of them were positive, but they even became, when they became worse or didn't improve, many of their antibody levels actually increased. And so the patients who did not improve demonstrated high antibody titers. Patients who did improve demonstrated lower or resolved antibody titers. And there's no statistical difference between their ages or the time between their tests. And we saw the same results with the CAM kinase assay. Group one that improved, overall reduction of all their activity. Group two, no statistically significant difference. When we looked at the sensitivity and the specificity of the panel, and we identify, was there a symptom correlation to positive test results? We see that there was an 89% sensitivity, 84% specificity, and an accuracy of 87%. And if you look at the receiver operator curve, which is just identifying the population of patients um, that positively, that, that uh, correctly were identified, uh, you see the dotted line, which is random. Anything above it indicates that it's, it's uh, correctly identifying. And you can see the number of patients going positive to negative, group one versus two. And then we compared it in one other way, looking at not the cutoff, but what's the magnitude of change in the patients, uh, their results. And with that, we got a similar sensitivity of 92% a specificity of 88% and an accuracy of 90%. Um, there are also a couple other published studies that came out, which is very interesting, related to autism. Dr. Richard Fry studied uh, 82 patients with autism and identified uh, 40, 49 out of those 82 or 60% had some autoimmune antibodies. He was then able to treat with intravenous immunoglobulin uh, 36 of those patients. And after they were treated, he looked at the responsiveness and compared it to the panel being able to predict it. They found that 81 to 88%, uh, the panel predicted the patients who would respond and improve to immunotherapy. And one last study here, uh, a patient diagnosed with schizophrenia over at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Uh, this patient was a 15-year-old girl who had been diagnosed and treated unsuccessfully uh, for schizophrenia and had psychosis, <laughs> severe anxiety, and depression in and out of treatment facilities. Her antibodies were, were very positive. Uh, the immunologist ordered one plasma phoresis. The patient had complete resolution of her psychotic OCD and anxiety symptoms. She was weaned off of olanzapine and uh, within two weeks, uh, she was back home and we talked to the physician. She's playing tennis uh, and she, we ran a test on her afterwards and everything was back to normal. The good thing is uh, there are treatment guidelines. Uh, in the JCAP uh, um, journal, um, the PANS physicians uh, group has put together a very nice set of uh, baseline guidance, treatment guidance. Um, this is going to probably continue to evolve, but if you're interested, that's something that we or AIO and M can send to you.
And typically the treatments fall into these different categories or buckets, anti-infectives, anti-inflammatories, immune modulators, um, and even effective allopathic integrative or natural treatments also fall into these categories. So the good news is there are treatments and more treatments will be coming out. So in summary here, I'm gonna share with you something I adapted from Dr. Sidney Baker called the TAC laws. Um, the first TAC law is here, if you're sitting on a TAC, uh, the treatment is not to Advil every three to four hours. Uh, the treatment for TAC sitting uh, is TAC removal. And the corollary is search for the root and treat the cause rather than the symptoms. Uh, the second TAC law is if you're sitting on two TACs, uh, removing one TAC doesn't eliminate 50% of the symptoms. Complex conditions are complex and to be effective, you have to address all the issues for resolution. So correctly diagnosing patients for the root cause with neuropsychiatric symptoms is really essential in order for treatment. The other problem is that most of these and probably all of them currently are diagnosed by symptom clusters. And when they identify symptom clusters, they're put into these different diagnostic categories and many more, but unfortunately these are deemed incurable. So there are many chronic disorders that can have a segment of a patient populations caused by an autoimmune etiology. And it's really important to identify the root. So the Cunningham panel can be an aid in the physician's diagnosis of PANDAS or PANS or other autoimmune encephalopathies. And AONM has doctors in the UK that can prescribe and, and order the panel. The second important piece is to locate a doctor who's open to working with patients having autoimmune neurologic disorders and they can prescribe the panel. So in closing, what's the key to change in reality? is one, we have to increase the awareness of autoimmune neurologic disorders. This is not just in children, but also in adults. And this is really one of the things I appreciate about AONM is that they are doing this and they're getting education out there. They're also doing the second part, which is more education about the biology of these conditions. Third is more research and clinical studies to better identify the etiology and discover more efficacious and targeted treatments, which we are doing here at Molecular Labs and many other institutions around the country. And the last one, if you're a patient uh, or if you're a parent or if you're one suffering from these is perseverance, because at some point, what might seem impossible is really becomes possible. So if you think about many other disorders, including things such as um, uh, peptic ulcers, which was thought to be just caused by stress. Uh, it was identified to be caused by a bacteria, Campylobacter or um, Helicobacter. And uh, in the beginning, it was thought that this individual was crazy. Till they now know and routinely test for that bacteria when you have a peptic ulcer and the therapy is antibiotics. And we believe that over time and perseverance, um, that pandas, pans, and many of these other autoimmune neurologic disorders will be the same, that they will identify them very quickly, patients will be treated effectively, and uh, we'll not see many of these autoimmune neurologic disorders uh, that last for, for a long time. Here's some additional resources, and um, there is the places in which you can contact uh, a whole host of different resources. Um, and I look forward to answering question. Uh, I typically, unfortunately, can do that is go too long, but I hope that there's time for questions. Thank you very much, Craig. That was <clears throat> absolutely fascinating and um, largely a new field for us here in the UK, must admit. Overall in Europe, we don't have the many years of experience that you do in the States, so we can learn a lot from you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions that um, I'd like to try and get in before half past. I, I believe we do need to finish um, on time more or less today, but we'll answer all the other questions afterwards. Um, we'll probably need to start a bit of a blog <laughs> mm -hmm. and have you working with us on that, Craig. Okay. So one <clears throat> of the questions is, um, 
would you recommend plasmapheresis to a young adult who has not responded to IVIG? Mm -hmm. So a uh, good question. Um, and again, I have to make a disclaimer. I'm a scientist and not a practicing physician. Um, but I would say that there are many um, that have, when they have not responded to different types of um, other therapies, have found success with plasmapheresis because the premise of plasmapheresis is that it removes immediately all the antibodies that are there. If the antibodies are the root cause, then patients, as you can see with the schizophrenia patient, rapidly improved. Um, there are other things to consider because always there's risk with any treatment, but depending upon the severity, um, often you will see that that is one of the choices that many of these practicing clinicians will go to. Thank you. And then another question is whether you could outline or at least give us a little insight into some naturopathic treatments that doctors over in the States have been having success with? Yeah, that, that's a, a great question and it's constantly actually evolving. Um, I would say that it falls into those same categories. So whether it is um, allopathic or naturopathic, you will see anything that uh, modulates, impacts, influences the immune system, strengthens the immune system, anything that decreases inflammation, which is why steroids are used. Um, but there are other things that will decrease inflammation, uh, including naturopathic remedies. Um, and anything, in many cases, um, there are uh, infectious organisms and more than one. So anti-infectives, uh, inf anti-inflammatories, immune modulators, and things that are play those role. We find the interesting that the gut is also uh, plays a role because there is an interaction between the gut and two thirds of the immune system is in the gut. Um, but as to specific types of things, I would think, um, well, you have other people that I think will come on and can speak um, more directly to specific treatments. But in general, if you think of those categories, those are the ones that are also used in allopathic medicine. Thank you. Could I just mention that we feel very privileged to have Dr. Sam Yanuk speaking to us on the 12th of May when we have a conference which is in Invisible Diseases Week in the UK and we'll mm -hmm. be focusing on ME and fibromyalgia and um, these kinds of conditions that have no clear cause and are often fobbed off as being neuropsychiatric. We'll be um, hearing from him the kinds of naturopathic treatments that he's been using very successfully over in the States. Um, mm -hmm. He's got a huge following, hasn't he? And he's seen many yes. thousands of patients. Yes. So um, please look at our webpage, AONM, and our events, and you'll see the 12th of May, that's a Sunday, it's here in central London. And then another question here, would low-dose naltrexone help being an immune modulator? Yes, so again, uh, referring to uh, what we've observed, um, there are many patients who have um, used LDN and uh, they have seen uh, good responses uh, on that. It depends also on other things that the patient has tried. If they have an infection and they haven't treated the infection, you might see some improvement, but maybe you won't see complete improvement. Uh, again, it's uh, an effector of different types of receptors in the brain, so it would make sense. Um, and again, um, those are some alternative therapies that other clinicians have found uh, to be successful in certain cases with certain patients. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, we will be um, having further seminars with you, um, Professor Shimazaki. Uh, we, we've planned a series of three, so we will let everybody know when those are going to take place and um, mm -hmm. possibly even have you on together with, for example, Dr. Uh, Dr. Yanuk or others. Mm -hmm. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? So that um, in terms of the treatments, I know it's a little unfair yes. to be piling on those questions. But mm -hmm. one other question that's come in is, will the Panningham Will the Cunningham panel test evolve over the next few years? Absolutely. And um, we are currently looking at a couple of other targets like the serotonin receptors. We believe that they may account for additional parts. We have about two dozen other markers uh, 
And the other is that we are um, using machine learning to try to take the 8,500 specimens we have and the knowledge from the patients that got well and those that didn't get well under certain treatments and produce an algorithm that would then be a part of the test. So when a patient would get a test, then their panel would predict the algorithm through the algorithm what treatments might be most effective so then the cl clinician could be able to then take that information and not have to um, trial and error as much but maybe identify certain treatments that have been most effective for that type of patient uh, profile. Wow, um, that so, would be absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the time frame on that, would you say? We are actually working on it now, and uh, everyone who does send in a test, and if you do, um, we ask that we get an informed consent so we can keep your specimen and that we can contact you in the future. That helps us with research because we now have over 8,500 of those specimens. And as we develop and identify other types of tests for different types of disorders that are autoimmune, whether it be things like chronic fatigue, uh, maybe uh, bipolar, chronic depression, uh, other things, we believe that these targets and these markers will have different types of uh, relevance to that also. Thank you. Could I just mention, Craig, that um, AONM has kindly been given a dispensation in terms of what you said earlier, that it had to be a physician who prescribes the test, because that's a learning curve here in the UK, and we don't yet have as many physicians as we'd like mm -hmm. um, who are aware of it and able to. Um, we do have um, a means whereby even non-physicians can prescribe this test and then often small teams begin to build around the patient depending on what's found and um, there is now the children's e-hospital mm -hmm. which is specializing in pans pandas but they do only see children and so the mm -hmm. problem is the adult patients yes. with conditions so those are important I, distinctions very, if i can comment yeah. on that yes um that and that that's good because um, as long as there's a provider who can uh, work with the patient, um, we we uh, are also happy to help. Um, the other is about children versus adults. Children grow up to be adults, and so many of these patients who were pans or pandas or autoimmune end up with being adults with these, and there are some later onset. So most of what we talked about. Uh, will apply to individuals at different ages. Um, there might be slightly different issues that they may face, um, but it is important to, re to remember that this is not necessarily a childhood uh, syndrome. Okay, well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. One further mention is that there are additional presentations up on our website. If you look at events, you'll see that um, we had an event with Moleculera last May and the presentations are there and uh, all downloadable and also the recordings are available. And then we had um, a conference that was our 2018 conference where Dr. Um, Madeline Cunningham spoke mm -hmm. and uh, we have her presentation and recordings up on the website too. So do um, have a look please at the AONM 2018 conference for that. And hopefully, um, Craig, we'll have you over again soon. I'd be delighted. Helping to educate us on these yeah. very, very pernicious and um, difficult mm -hmm. to treat conditions. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Uh, that was great. And further questions have come in. So we'll be sending them to you and asking if you wouldn't mind um, answering them. And we'll be sending out this recording and the um, slides to everybody who registered for this. Mm -hmm. And um, so thank you so, so much. Thank you, Jillian, and I appreciate all that AONM has done to help educate, and we'll, we'll be happy to support you in any way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.